Right. Hello there. Um, welcome to a, another From the Outside Looking In podcast. This one's going to be completely different from some of the other stuff that I've done. People who have watched them know that these started off talking about uh, homelessness, addiction, other various issues that sort of face some of us and that I faced over the years, which is why I, I like to talk about those things. Um, from there, I sort of I veered off here and there down other avenues. And I actually I, I got talking um, to an old guy at the type of places that people in recovery like myself go to. And he watches my podcast and he, he was saying that he was enjoying them. And he, he sort of mentioned that it would be good to get a politician on. And then I said that um, getting a politician on would be interesting for me because I don't vote. And from there, we sort of bounced a couple of ideas backwards and forwards. And he mentioned a politician that he'd seen on TV recently, who he said was a, a, a character, etc. I I went off, I had a look at some of the stuff that I could find on YouTube. Um, indeed, yeah, I agreed. And I will say this, I sent a, a well-worded email and this politician got straight back to me, um, done a bit of due diligence and has agreed to come on uh, pretty, pretty quickly. So I've got to thank him for that. So I'm just going to introduce the right honourable Sir Desmond Swain and if I add you there you are good morning um Sir Desmond Swain this is a good morning this is a turn up in the books for me because it, you know I wouldn't have expected that I would be talking to someone such as yourself so I just I'll start off um we're going to talk about voter apathy and the fact that I don't vote and we're sort of I, I wanted to get into the reasons why I don't vote but what I will say is that um straight away something that really sort of put me off politics in general is the uh, you know I because I do all of this and I release it on social media I just on my own personal Facebook I, I put a post up saying oh I'm doing a I'm doing a podcast with Sir Desmond Swain. He's agreed to come on. Has anybody got any questions and I I, I made it clear that I was doing it about the fact that I don't I don't vote, you know, not out of, you know, I don't staunchly not vote on purpose. It's just something that isn't part of my life. And when I put, has anybody got any questions? It was meant to be about not voting. And I grew up in the northeast of England. So I would say that a lot of my friends um, that I've grown up with are more left left wing, they, you know, Labour supporters. And just the, the anger and, you know, the questions that they wanted me to ask to the point where I was arguing with them saying, well, no, why would I do that? I, I you know, it's not about personal politics. And, you know, people wanted me to hold you to account for things that you voted for that aren't of any interest to me. And what what happened is I saw how angry politics makes people and it put me off even more you know it became so divisive that it, it sort of put me off even more and then from there I really I have gone in to sort of look at the reasons why why I don't vote um you know and why other people don't vote and before we do that though I did I did just want to sort of introduce yourself you are um an MP for is it the New Forest South West yep yeah, lovely part of the country. I used to um I used to live down in Titchfield, which wasn't too far from there. So I would drive down there and I sort of went onto Wikipedia. I, I could only get bits and bobs of information about you because like I say, I'm not au fait with the political world. Uh I was surprised I assumed that you would have gone straight into politics, but it turns out that is it right that you were a teacher and a bank manager and stuff beforehand and you know yet you, you had, dare I say it, real jobs before you decided yeah. to go into politics. Yeah, I had a career. Yeah. Um so then what what led you to go into politics? What were the reasons and what age, et cetera, were you? I'd always wanted to go into politics. Right, OK. Um, so I saw my careers previously as being um, not so much temporary, but certainly my ambition was to get into politics. And I've always taken the view that people should have a career first. Right. They should have experience of ordinary life. I think um, our habit, increasing habit of electing younger MPs who've never really done a great deal other than be political agitators is um, uh, is to be deprecated. I think you're much better having people who have experience of life, who've done something, uh, and then come into politics subsequently. I, you know, I wanted to get into politics since the 1970 general election, uh, when our member of parliament came to address us on the village green, and I, I suppose I was 14, um, and um, he got up in the back of his uh, Land Rover with a megaphone and started to give it the rooty toot. Um, there was a riot, and he was literally driven 
from the place <laughs> um, <laughs> by the angry <laughs> villagers. Um, and the MP in question was Robert Maxwell. Right, OK. Uh, and I just remember witnessing this scene. I didn't have any, at 14, any political views of my own. I just remember witnessing it and thinking, crikey, what an exciting way to make a living. Right. Subsequent, so I knew I wanted to be a politician, yeah. but I'm, I didn't actually develop political views till the rest of that decade. The, the 70s, remember, was a particularly troubled a time we had the miners strike we had yeah. um the winter of discontent um and the conservative party moving more explicitly to the right under uh, under maggie um uh, and the labor party moving explicitly to the left under michael foot and that sort of characterized my political views uh, uh and i became increasingly conservative in my outlook right okay so um that's sort of going to bring me on to you know why people why people don't vote because you're saying there that you sort of you, you your interest was pricked in it at 14 years old and I, you know I've got what I've done is I've gone online and I've, I've sort of looked at the the main reasons that sort of you know experts think people don't vote and then at the end if you don't mind we'll quickly go over I've had a look at myself and why I don't vote so we just go over and one of the things is people don't vote because um it isn't taught in schools there's not really enough you know you Growing up, I didn't know anything about the political system, about, you know, parties, about how parliament works. Really importantly, nothing about the election process. I mean, that isn't in school at all. I think I, I don't know. I, I know your man did due diligence on me, but to be honest, I barely went to school and I was done by 14. But, you know, reading up on it, I know that um, sort of politics even now is it's an opt in it thing that comes along later on in your school life. So here's part of the reason, because I know young people don't vote, you know, out of all of the demographics that don't vote. I think it's a third of the population, roughly, um, you know, third of the electorate, sorry, the people that can vote don't vote. And it's mainly the young people that don't vote. And I just wonder, you know, what your thoughts are on the fact that in school, you know, should there be more, not necessarily about party politics, because they should keep that out of school, in my opinion. You know, that's something you, you form yourself. But just, you know, how an election works, how the process works. You, you, there's so Because it's not as straightforward as just you vote for who you want and that person ends up yeah. in charge. Well, I don't think it is anyway. It doesn't seem to be yeah. that to me. Uh, my my, my, my um, reluctance is prompted by the fact that I receive a large correspondence from people telling me of all sorts of things that they want to be taught in schools. Uh, and um, I, you know, it's a crowded timetable already. And I'm much more concerned that people le learn to read, write and count. And yes, there are all sorts of things it would be nice to have, but people are telling me all the time that we need to have education X, Y and Z. And I think there is space in the curriculum for that. There's the what, what's called PGCE. I can't remember what it stands for. Uh, but nevertheless, that is a wider education of, of public um, uh, public policy can fit into that. And you can have your education, what Parliament does and how uh, elections work. And, and frankly, the Parliament has a very good education department that reaches out to schools. In that way and lots of the schools in my constituency feed into that process they come up uh, for visits to the house of commons i go along and speak to them only recently i did a, a uh, provided a uh, a memory stick uh, of a talk to a school because they got covid i couldn't go to the school so i gave it to them and i engage with schools in my con constituency whenever i'm invited to do so so i'm skeptical but there's a great need to enhance that. Of course, you know, some people do politics, GCSE and A-level. But yeah. you're right, there is space in you the curriculum yeah. without having an explicit subject. Yeah. There's a whole range of areas of public interest and public health that you can fit this into. I, I would. So when you say your constituency, though, so and please don't take this the wrong way. But, you know, I've been to the New Forest. It's a lovely area. Um your constituency isn't the type of area that I grew up in and the schools there won't be the type of schools that I went to. So I don't remember any of that in sort of inner city schools in urban areas. You know, I don't remember any politics at all. So and nobody engaged. I, it might be different now because obviously I went to school a long time ago. 
Um, but I, I, I didn't see anybody from Parliament engaging with a school from a sort of council area in the northeast of England. Well, you should um, take that up with your own MP. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. And this is, you know, one of the things that sort of was highlighted to me when everybody wanted me to sort of hold you to account. One of my friends stepped in who is quite sort of passionate about politics and also, you know, he's left wing, but he summed up when he said that I can't hold anybody to account because I don't vote. So I've lost that right to, do you know what I mean? So, you know, I am, I am aware of that. Um, It's just that when, you know, I'm also aware of that, you know, maybe I don't vote because I didn't have those things going on that you just talked about. Yeah. But when you you, say you you can't hold your own piece of account because you don't vote, I mean, the fact is it's a secret ballot. I don't know who voted and who didn't. Yeah. So whoever, whenever a constituent emails me, they get the response that, that, that I would give to any constituent because I don't know whether they voted or not. And I certainly don't know how they voted. Yeah, you've got even no clue if they even voted if they for often you. Enough say how they voted. How well, would you know it's a secret ballot? Yeah, it is. Uh, that sort of that sort of leads me on to the next part. I mean, you know, I don't want this to be a massive long, you know, we've only got so long in a day but i was reading up about a lot of people don't vote because of safe seat residents so you're saying that you don't know how people vote but actually you know for me especially growing up in the northeast i think has changed now i know that labor lost the northeast after brexit and everyone was exhausted but you know growing up there it's labor labor get in so i was just thinking if you were somebody that was a conservative or a Lib Dem voter or a Greenpeace voter, etc., and you know that it's going to be a Labour winner, does that mean that you just don't bother to go out and vote because you think your vote's a waste? Is your vote a waste in that area? That's what I want to know. Well, I'm not, I've never believed in the in the, the wasted vote um, uh, conundrum. Um, I, I, th- I think you record your... Um, your feelings on the ballot paper. Uh, you cast your vote uh, because you didn't win. Didn't mean it was a waste of your time. You tried to win. You recorded your preference, yeah. and it is, it is important to political parties to look at the total vote, not just what happened in a particular constituency. It's important for political parties to look at their total mandate and see actually what the division of votes was across the entire country. Um, uh, and that can be a salutary lesson about what people really think, even if you won uh, a certain number of constituencies and got a majority. You want to know what the whole makeup of the nation was. So I think that's important. But people can also vote tactically. And if you've got no chance yeah, of getting I mean, your own preference, then you, you, you know, remember there are an awful lot of marginal seats where it does make a vital difference. Yeah, you know that. See, the, the thing you know when you start talking about tactical voting and stuff again, that's something that puts me off because I don't know what people are talking about. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Well, so someone I mean, says to me, "You need you, to vote tactically." Yeah. I'm like, so so, 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 I mean, a tactical voting is simply, you know, a, a logical choice you make. Look, my candidate, the candidate I really like to win, yeah. hasn't got any chance. So I'm going to vote for the one that's most likely to get the man that I don't like out. Uh, see. There's a part of me that instantly just doesn't like that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it, it, and, and I don't. I'm either. not. You know, I, I'm not I, tactical kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, I, I personally would never vote tactically. I will vote to record my choice. Coming back to my answer to your previous question, yeah. because I want that to be recorded nationally. That my party, the party that I wanted to win, got x number of votes out of the total, and that right. and that's important to me. But but interestingly, there. That would that would stop me voting if I knew that the only point in me voting was to vote tactically. Personally, yeah. I wouldn't bother voting, well, well, and that must be yeah. that must be a reason why lots of people don't vote. Yeah, well, personally, sort of... I, as I say, I, personally, I would never vote tactically myself. Yeah, I will vote for the for what I believe in, even even if it yeah even if it's yeah. not. I, mean, I don't want to say no. Was... I don't want to say no point, but you'd yeah. rather just vote for somebody that you know isn't going to win rather than vote tactically. Yeah, than yeah. I, I, you know, I, you, uh, my I, my vote is important, and I'm going to vote. For me, <laughs> yeah. Can you, are you allowed, you're allowed to vote for yourself? But, you know, before you I was for voting yourself? for me, I oh, have vote voted in constituencies uh, in the past where where my candidate had had the can hell's chance of being elected. Right. Uh, but nevertheless, I voted for him. Okay. Okay. Um, one of the things I, I know the last um, general election. What, what was the turnout like on the last general election? If actually it was probably... it was it was better in my view. I mean I come from a constituency where 
um, I've got a very high retired population and therefore we tend to have a, a high uh, level of turnout because people are in, you know, they yeah. are in the habit of voting. Yeah, as you um, get older. But I think generally the, 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 the turnout was was approaching the numbers that we used to get. I mean, certainly you would expect about three quarters of the voters to 80 percent in a good election right. to turn out. There was a point. I think there was a point after Brexit. I think there was more talks of more votes and everyone just felt burnt out because I say that I haven't voted. I voted for Brexit. I took part in that vote. I don't know. Something happened in the country. It woke everybody up a little bit. We all went out and voted. Um, but afterwards, I was so exhausted <laughs> by, you know, just the sort of the atmosphere that sort of came about, you know, people. And obviously, a lot of it's online, but people that I've grown up with that are my friends, because I voted leave. I'll just say that I voted leave, um, you know, and but people that I've grown up with were so angry. And I was like, you know, they were, it was sort of painting out anybody that voted differently. And this is both sides. Anybody that voted different to them was a bad person. And again, it's sort yeah. of, it's put yeah. me off. Yeah. It, it's got to the yeah. point where it, it's put me off politics because if I was to say anything, I would say I'm centre of left, um, you know, and a lot of my friends are centre of right. But there seems to be, you know, the left and the right just hate each other. And it's uh, yeah, just well, a bit... what we, what I think you're right. I, 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 it's not as bad as you make out because right. I've got lots of friends who voted differently to me. Yeah, uh, were passionate in this, their support for staying in the European Union, whereas right. I was passionate in my support for coming out, and we're still the best of friends. Yeah. Well, do you know what? Do you know what? This is interesting. My wife and I went out, and because I'm not very, because you know, I'm not like a political household. You know, I, she was like, "Oh, I don't know who to vote for." I said, "Vote for who you want." You know, it doesn't yeah. it doesn't bother me that someone votes differently. So we both went out to vote. She hadn't made her mind up. I voted to leave, and then she went in and made her mind up right on the spot and voted to remain. And we both realised that we could have just stayed home that day and saved ourselves the trouble. <laughs> do you know what I mean? But um, yeah, it's record your. But 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 so so, so but nevertheless, you're right. I have. A few friends mm -hmm. who, or, or ex friends, who were very, very angry and hold me personally responsible for the fact that we left and no longer communicate with me I, at all. You know, we've been cancelled. But, but by and large, yeah. most people, you know, hey, you know, so we disagreed about something, but, you know, life is bigger and more important than that. Do you think that's most people? It doesn't feel like it sometimes, but I suppose... I, undoubtedly, there is still a level of significant anger. Yeah. But I overwhelmingly, most of the people with whom I disagreed over Brexit, yeah. I still get on perfectly well with. Most right. of them. That just, you know, just a separate question. You know, when you're in like the House of Commons, this is me just asking questions. When you, have, have you got friends that are, are Labour? You know, have you got MP friends that yes, are, are Labour MPs? Yes, and you, you sort of chill out, or do you all hate each other? No, no, <laughs> we all get on very, very well. And, <laughs> and people have this image of the House of Commons, which is characterised by the only bit that they've ever watched, which is House, which is Prime Minister's questions. When you're screaming, well, you've each got other. this bear pit. Yeah, you know. Of two sides, and your champion is going out to beat the hell out the other guy, and you're cheering him on, and their side are cheering him on, and it's very, very confrontational. But that's only for half an hour a week. Right. But overwhelmingly, the rest of the week, you know, whilst we might have different opinions, we all actually want the same outcome. We all want things to be better for everyone. Right. Be it the NHS, be it education, or whatsoever, we might differ about how to achieve that end, but we all want the same end. And so, actually, we have great friendships across the house, and we get on very well indeed in many respects. Okay, well, <laughs> you say that you all want the best, right? Which you know, I I will say, okay, fair enough. But what I will say is, <laughs> talking to a lot of my friends now that. You know, the, if there's a vote coming up, uh, and this is a feeling that I'm getting from a lot of people from every side of the sort of political spectrum, whether they're conservative, Labour or um, Lib Dems, is that they're just completely disillusioned and there's no centre ground. And, you know, they're looking out and it, it doesn't feel like there's anybody to vote for that's any real different from the other person. So what do you do? when you look out and you just don't see somebody that's sort of grabbing your interest. And I will say this, um, and, you know, it's not, it's never personal politics or anything, but for me personally, the last 
couple of years with the whole COVID thing, you know, I'm seeing, I get told to do something, but then I see somebody go for a drive to test their eyesight, which I, you know, I, I don't think that's true. And then I hear about parties that people didn't know about, which again, I don't think it's true. Do you know what I mean? So it gets to the point where I'm like, well, I feel like the people in charge are mugging me off, so I'm not going to vote for them. But then I look to the opposite, and this is just me personally, I look to the opposite side, and I don't see any different, I, you know, the behavior is not the same, but I, I just see nothing there. I, I don't see that anybody's going to do anything that different. And I just think to myself, well, there's no point in going to vote then. So I might as well just crack on as normal. So, you know, I know that a lot of people are disillusioned over the last couple of years with everything that's gone on. Um, so what would you say to them that just there's there's nobody for me to vote for? There is no one out there that I think. Well, I think you've got to remember that you're, you are your 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 cross goes next to a name, yeah. an individual. You are choosing between a number of individuals. You are putting your trust in their judgment over the next parliamentary period, usually five, four or five years, to cast their vote on your behalf, to use their judgment to achieve the best that can be achieved and to make choices on your behalf, to represent you. Uh, and therefore, when it comes down to your choosing an individual, yeah. research those individuals. You know, d d do a profile of, of the different candidates and choose the best man or the best woman. Because ultimately, it's not a political party that decides. It's the individuals who are elected to represent you who cast votes on your behalf in Parliament. But so I've seen it that way. Yeah, Choose the, the individual. Put your the, the, faith in a person. I, I've seen I've seen in the past, though, when people have been elected and then the moment they came in, was it when the coalition government got formed and, you know, the, they came straight in and broke promises straight away. You know, people had voted them in to do a particular thing. I think it was the um, was it student fees and they came yes, in and yeah. they instantly broke that promise. Yeah. Um, so so that's why I that's why I don't favor those electoral systems that habitually provide for coalitions as they do on in continental Europe. Those electoral systems tend to turn out coalitions all the time. Right. And so instead of a political party coming together and making its pledge to the electorate and being feel, feeling that it's bound by it afterwards, what happens is the political parties go to the electorate, get their votes, come together, make a coalition and stitch together a program that no one actually voted for. Yeah, because which it is what happened to the explicitly. So, but so I can understand, you know, the frustration that grows amongst voters when politicians don't stick to what they said they would do. But you know, equally, <laughs> equally, you do have to accept. Yeah, that, you know, let, let's be honest. How many people read the political manifesto at an election? They're not voting for specific policies. They tend to vote for values. Do, does that political party share my values? Does that person share my values? Um, does that candidate share my values rather than a detailed list of all the things that that candidate will do? Because as we know, that candidate, whilst he might want to do all sorts of things, things change, the facts change, and you may be in no position to do all the things that you wanted to do. And when this last um, general election is a, is a typical example of that. Nobody knew when we voted on the 12th of December 2019 that within a month we were going to be hit by a pandemic, which changed everything. Yeah, you need to get on with that. <laughs> <laughs> so there's got to be some flexibility. Yeah, I know what you're saying, but then for me, when I remember back to that whole that Lib Dem thing, when it's something that that sort of blatant that, you know, vote us in and we will do this. And then when they're voted in, sorry, we're not doing that. Shouldn't there be some kind of punishment? You know, something. Well, there was a so punishment. Just, was there? I don't see. I don't know. Yeah, the punishment yeah. was they got wiped out at the next election. They oh, went from that, 55 it, seats to, went 55 seats to, what was it, under 10? Or, that, or, or, or of that order. But, I mean, but, that's but a, I agree with you. I, we were shocked. Because we didn't actually require them 
to sign up. You know, the, the, the coalition negotiations actually allowed them to stick with their position and to vote against the provisions that we were bringing in, for which we were committed to, on student fees. But no, they, they, they almost framed the policy, you know, uh, and, and, and voted for it with, or a majority of them voted for it with enthusiasm. I could never personally understand how they could have, have taken that vault face, but there it is. And, but you're right, they were punished. They were held to account. At the next election, they were thrown out big time. But does their punishment, did that help the people that they lied to? Or was it, you know, a token punishment kind of thing? Well, I'm afraid that in, in, in democratic politics, it is a fact that many people vote against something that they don't like rather than vote for something that they do or want. Right, and that, okay. and that's, that's a legitimate reason for voting. I know that lots of my constituents go out on polling day to vote against me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and now you just have to live with that. Yeah, yeah, that's all right. <laughs> I feel you. I feel you. Right. So we'll move on. I just wanted to get to then. That, that's sort of the reason I was looking on online at why people don't vote. Um, actually, you know, there was one thing it was saying that it's sort of the, the lack of the drop in voters has coincided with the age of the internet. Um, and it, 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 there's a sort of theory that because our news now comes to us through personal algorithms when we're online. Um, we only get what we're interested in. So back in a day, politics would be forced, not forced upon us, but it would be front page of the, you know, tabloid newspapers, which growing up was the Sun or the Daily Mirror or, you know, what you, you the big ones that the rich people read on the London Underground. Um, do you know what I mean? But there, it, it was, there wasn't that much news available to us. So we had to we had to listen to the news or read the news that, dare I say it, somebody like Rupert Murdoch made us read. And now that that's gone, people just, their, their, their interest is disappearing because they're not having it forced on them. Um, and there's the argument that Rupert Murdoch actually elected the last few people, and that's sort of dying out now. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I'm sceptical about that. I mean, I, I think that, you know, P -p -p people, you know, see headlines, but they make up their own minds. I mean, I, I, I put it rather differently. I think people have very, very busy lives. Yeah. You know, there's a lot on. They've got a mortgage to pay. They're worried about, you know, all sorts of demands uh, that are on them at work. They've got children to get to school in the morning. And every now and again, they might catch a headline on the early evening news. But, you know, they've got lots and lots of things going on in their lives. And if politics isn't particularly important to them you can understand why you know they wouldn't focus on it and feel um engaged to go out and vote i try and persuade people look everything's about politics you know it, you know people write to me all the time about issues that they don't think they don't consider them to be politics but actually they are there's a political well, solution yeah to and that's 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 where I've come from with this, with doing this podcast, because obviously my podcast is usually about homelessness. I was homeless for a long time. Um, you know, addiction. I've, I've struggled with that most of my life. Um, I'm doing well now. Uh, you know, various social issues, uh, you know, but then I realized that actually there is scope to talk to a politician because even though I don't vote, these are issues that should be sorted out. But this that leads me on to why I don't vote and why I've never voted. And I'll sort of say this when I started arguing with my mates when you know i was saying any questions and they wanted me to hold you to account and hold the tories to account and you know there was a lot of you know the tories are the cause of this the tories and I, i'll say straight away tories labor all the same to me like i said i don't vote i've got no i've got no right to hold anybody to account but um i was you know when people are saying our oh, my friends especially when they say oh you know it's the tories you've got to vote labor my worst years in my life were under the blair government and, you know, that was the whole time that I was homeless was under the Blair government. Um, I, I was born into a Tory government, but I was born into abject poverty kind of thing. So a large reason why I don't vote is because for me personally, and I could be completely wrong, and you probably tell me I am, um, no government really changes anything. Do you know what I mean? That's what it feels like to me. It feels like I was, I was talking to my wife last night. I couldn't tell you and if you might spring up some and completely make me look silly but i couldn't i couldn't name a single policy that's had a drastic effect to my life positive or negatively 
I've sort of plodded along, trying to better myself slowly but surely. And I, in my mind, I don't think either government has made that much of a difference to where I've ended up. The armed forces has made the big difference, if I'm saying anything. Well, I mean, I, 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 I do disagree with you. I think it, it, it makes a fundamental difference. I mean, let's face it. Let, let, let's let's take the, the 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 division between the parties. In my view, is that my outlook is very much for a smaller state that does less and leaves people with more of their own money, lower taxes, more responsibility to make the best of their lives themselves. Uh, whereas the, uh, the 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 left the, uh, the the left of the political spectrum is for bigger government for the government that knows best, for the government to bring about changes on your behalf, which of course costs you more, so your taxes will be higher. I believe in personal responsibility, free enterprise, less government, because to be honest, governments don't do things particularly well, and therefore the less we expect them to do for us, probably for the better. And so that's the two differences between outlook. Of course, can I just a, can I just jump in? I don't, deal of, sorry, yeah, I don't... Deal of, of space and agreement in the middle, and it is only a balance. But yeah, I think Desmond, those two things Desmond, make a difference. I don't mean to jump in, but I just I do have to ask this. You know how you was just explaining the left? Would they explain themselves like that, or would they say no? That's incorrect. This is what well, we actually want. And I, explain no, I, think, differently. I think I don't think they'd be fair. They would say, look, collective action is more effective. It is best for the government to act and to solve problems on your behalf. And, of course, I agree with some of that, but, but it, it, it comes down to a balance. It comes down to how much of the economy should be determined by government action and how much should be left to free enterprise and individuals making decisions on yeah. behalf of themselves and their families. And I I'm just... on that part of the spectrum. But as I say, there's a great deal of common ground between the parties. I just, yeah, and, I just and, and, and that's why it's important in a democracy that you do have effective opposition and you do have a competition yeah. well, to keep the governing party on its toes. So, I mean, what I'll say, I, I just wanted to make sure that I get in that because I'm aware that even though like I'm saying I'm not left, you know, I don't vote, I'm aware mm. that I'm talking to somebody from one yeah. party, you know, and I don't want it to just be, oh, well, our party does this and the other party, yeah, yeah. And, you know, they're not there to sort of say, well, yeah, we well, don't agree with anybody, that. Anybody when, when you me, said when, there, when, though, Particularly when I go into schools, and people yeah. ask me a question. I always caveat it by saying, well, hold on a minute. I'm not an objective observer. I'm a partisan. Right. OK. Uh, <laughs> right. We sort of start finishing up now. One of the things I've got to get this word right. Um, is the government a corporate? How do you, how do you say this word? A corporate, a corporatocracy. Is that right? Is it, is it corporatocracy? Right. There you go. So my wife was trying to teach me to say it last night. Yeah. I did learn it, but I've woke up and forgot everything. I mean, there's always a. De I don't like that ocracy. Yeah. <laughs> I don't well, like that, that settlement because that you know where you've got uh, and and this was way we were heading in the 1970s, where basically the view of government was that it's for the government to come together with the trade unions and the um, the CBI and settle it all together and ha take a corporate view uh, and govern it in the best interests of the nation from that standpoint. I, I, I you know, I'm, I'm with the little platoons. I think the economic growth doesn't come from large corporates. Most people overwhelmingly work for small enterprises mm. and you need to release that free enterprise and spirit of innovation um, which isn't suited by large corporate governments where the great worthy trade unions and the worthy runners of the biggest industries come together and negotiate with government and decide, right, this is the way we're going to do things. That's, that's, that's what my it feels... understanding of the corporatocracy. Yeah, but I, mean, I don't what... like it. That's what it feels um, like to me. Of course, you're right to an extent that, yes, there is clearly an element of that, but the less the better, in my view. But it doesn't feel like it's the less the better to me. This is just my personal opinion. It feels like that's how the country is run to the point where I, I started really. Uh, your your guy that um, did his due diligence on me um, said it, it was nice what he said. Sorry, I'm just trying to get the quote up that he said about me. Um, he, you know, he said, yeah, straight talk and perceptive appreciates a moral and philosophical discussion. So do you know what I mean? I was looking. He also said 
his podcast doesn't seem to have a massive reach, which I thought was a bit harsh, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I thought there's no need for that. But, you know, it led me to think, I started really thinking about the whole corp, I can't say the word, corporatocracy, um, you know, and then I started asking, is the government just some kind of illusion? Do we need it? If If you stopped existing, you know, tomorrow, if something happened and there was no government, would we all stop going to work? And then I, I sort of did a little bit more digging and I found out that Belgium um, yeah. in, two, in 2010 went 541 days without forming a government. Belgium's still there. And then, yeah. then they, they beat their own record and went nearly 600 days in 2020 without forming a government. So Belgium's still there. So then I'm like, do we do we even need yeah. a government? I mean, well, that's have the we... bureaucracy, isn't it? Because yeah. have remember, we... the civil service and the existing legal structures all remained whether you had a government or not. Um, so yes, you could you could run things on that basis. But yeah. how would you bring about change? Because I mean, we only change things by changing the law and changing those structures. So yes, if you're quite happy with the way things are going, then right. you could live under under that system. But is that not what, I want change? Is that not why most people like myself don't vote? Because I'm quite happy with the way things are going. Which, which you brings know? me back to the point that I made, you know, earlier. Yeah. People have busy lives and yeah. they've got lots to worry about. And if they're not particularly worried about who's running the country, because they're reasonably satisfied that that it couldn't be run any better, or they don't think it would be run any better, you can understand them taking that point of view. Well, Equally, yeah. I'm, so I'm, 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 I suppose I'm a minority view amongst politicians. Most politicians really are um, exercised over low turnout in elections um, and, and regarded as a, a, as a real affront. Indeed, they blame the voters often mm. enough and they say that voters should be made to vote. Like they are in Australia. They should have to do it. My view is, I take a more relaxed view, I think some people... For some people, you know, actually, you know, they don't mind. So why should we make them mind? Well, do you know, equally, that, that, that was equally, bring me on. equally, there are some people who vote who don't vote as a protest. Yeah, as a yeah. protest, yeah. and yeah. I I'm think, not... well, hey, I believe in people's right to protest. It's a legitimate form of protest. But here's a here's a little tip for you. If you want to protest. The rules are that any ballot paper that is spoilt must be shown to each of the candidates so they can agree that it was a spoilt ballot or whether it's a valid ballot paper. A paper is valid if the clear voters intention is there. In other words, if you put your cross in the right place, that's a valid paper. Any other mark can make it invalid. Unless you you could turn the ballot paper over and write your protest, it would remain largely a valid, valid paper because the cross on the right side would be in the, in the column that it's supposed to be showing clearly your intent, but every candidate would have to be shown your protest on the back to agree that this was a valid paper or not. Right. <laughs> There's one way of protesting and voting. So the, the final two things that I was going to come on to then, which you, you've just sort of covered there. Um, I, I don't, mine's not a protest. I don't not vote out of protest. I vote because I can't be bothered. But then I've wrote there, laziness. A lot of it's laziness. You know, do I, just, because my life's going all right and I don't think yeah. that anybody's going to make that much difference to it, right or wrong, that's just how I feel. Yeah. I don't bother to vote because it's lazy. So should voting be compulsory like it is in some countries? You've already said no. Um, I could see an argument for, I mean, if you made me go and vote, I'd probably go and vote. But then, you know, I, I know people that if you tried to make them go and vote, they would get really angry about it. So what your your opinion is, no, it shouldn't be compulsory. Uh, definitely not. I mean, I think you, 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 you're quite right. It would make people angry um, if they don't want to do that. I, you know, I, what has made me angry over the last couple of years is governments telling us how to live, we should, how we should live our lives, who we may meet, what we must wear. Um, uh, where we must go to work, you know, the whole COVID intrusion into our liberties. This would be another intrusion into my liberty. You know, why should I vote if I don't want to? What, yeah. what right have you to make me do something that I don't want to? Yeah. 
Yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I, I, I agree. And we won't get into the COVID thing because we'll be here all day. But I'm sick of it. I'll just say that. I'll say I'm double jabbed. So I. I'm double jabbed, and I'm sick of it now. Um, and it needs to, it needs to, they need to hurry up and get it over and done with. Uh, final sort of thing. Yeah, you've already said this, but we'll just sort of go over it again if you don't mind. I was going to ask this, but you, you sort of explained it at the beginning. Actually, I was going to say, bearing in mind that um, I'm probably left of centre, uh, and if I was to vote. The chances are I'm not I'm going to vote Labour, maybe, you know, and I say maybe I don't really know, but the chances are I'm going to vote. So by me not voting and therefore not voting against your party, do you care that I don't vote or is it easier that I don't vote? I I tend to if you you know, I tend to the view that it's healthier if people vote right. um, and I would. Of course, I always want to be on the winning side, and I much prefer uh, you to vote for me or my party. But I think in terms of choice, I'd rather take the risk of the consequences of your voting Labour than have you not vote. Right. Okay. So uh, given a choice, I'd prefer you to vote. OK. Well, I don't know if I'm going to. <laughs> Although, you know what? I was thinking about this. I, Brexit charged everybody up. I've got a feeling that COVID might have recharged everybody's batteries when the, the next lot of voting comes around because, you know, both sides mm. have sort of – we've. All, we, but there's a lot of strong feelings regarding what we need to do now. So I've got a feeling that, yeah, you know, you never know. I might, I might go mm. out and my wife might come out. We should probably vote the opposite as me again. And the whole thing would be pointless and I should have just stayed home. Right. Listen, I just want to say thank you very much. Um, like I said, you got straight back to me, um, you know, with that email that I sent you. So I'm very grateful that you got straight back to me. You got your man to do due diligence, which I'd never heard of before because I'm quite ignorant. Stuff like yeah, that. because there's always a danger. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Um, you know, you get some with a clear political agenda. Yeah, who wants to you know frame you and use you for their purposes? So yeah, well, you, that's what I mean. Just uh, take the, yeah, what, what's yeah. interesting? What's interesting is actually I will say this: I I I was worried that you would come in with your clear political agenda. That's another thing, you know, that there's that instant sort of distrust. That, but uh, you know, this has gone the way that I wanted it to go. It's just been a general conversation about why people don't vote, why I don't vote. Um, Hopefully anybody watches it understands why I don't get into personal politics, uh, you know, and you, you, you're a guest on the podcast that I do. So, yeah, I just want to say thank you before I wrap it up and say goodbye. And, um, yeah, good luck for the future. Well, thanks very much. I've enjoyed the conversation and, and good luck to you. Thank you very much. to Desmond.